Okay, so today is April 30th, 2022, and we have a very special guest on the show today, Dr. Joy James. Dr. James is a world-renowned scholar um, and activist and is the Ebenezer Fitch Professor of Humanities at Williams College. Dr. James is also the author of numerous books, including Resisting State Violence, Radicalism, Gender and Race in U.S. Culture, States of Confinement, Policing, Detention, and Prisons, and Seeking the, uh, Seeking the Beloved Community, a Feminist Race Reader, and also the author of the forthcoming book In the Pursuit of Rev Revolutionary Love. Dr. James is also the editor of The New Abolitionist and Imprisoned in in Intellectuals. Over the course of her career, Dr. James has received numerous grants and fellowships and awards. Dr. James, thank you so much for coming on the show today and welcome to the show. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for you know having me in conversation with you. Um, so first, I wanted to note and thank you for being such a major part of the inspiration for the creation of the Activist News Network, um, specifically the June 12th, 2021 Summit on Accountability and Social Movements that you and Gerald Ball organized and hosted on Black Power Media was a major inspiration for the creation of the Activist News Network. So I do want to note that and, and, and thank you for that. Um, yeah. And if you're okay, I'll add a little something to it. I mean, it's, it's always the young people, right? Who like make you do stuff you're supposed to be doing anyway. So there were a number of 20 something year old activists, uh, African-American, uh, queer, trans, very much invested working with mothers who had lost their children to the violence of police forces, right, in the U.S. And I had met other mothers in Chicago, but these mothers they knew would be in California or Ohio. And it was from organizing with them and trying to offer support. And also, you know, I talk a lot about the limitations of my profession as an academic. Like, you, we, we do some good things and then we mess up some stuff, right? But the impetus for having that summit really came from 20 something year olds. And I mean, I don't have permission to put their names out now, but um, so Rebecca, first names, Rebecca, Deshaun and others, um, John. And so I'm grateful and I learned a lot too. Like I made some missteps. So, but that was a learning endeavor. And I think collectively with all their contacts, you know, those are the people who came on the platform. And again, again, some of the people I knew, Shapiro Wells from um, Chicago, um, Max Parthas, who's with the Abolish um, Slavery National Network. They do excellent work, right, in terms of the 13th Amendment and the exploitation of prison labor. But a lot of the young people on those platforms have been organizing for years. And I think some of your questions are gonna, you know, point to how is it that nonprofits as corporations can you know flood funds in and then sort of direct uh, activism into uh, mostly a U-turn, right? Back into the status quo, back into the state, but with promises, as Cabral says, for greater benefits. But the youth are what keep me honest and real. So that's my long intro to say, I wasn't the impetus behind that. It was, um, it was actually this, these young activists. Thank you for saying that. And I will I'll put the link to the to the summit in the description of this video so that um, the audience can more easily access it. Um, but um, which leads me to my first question. Um, in the wake of the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd by the police in the spring of 2021, there was this incredible grassroots movement which led to the defund and abolish movement. And it, it seemed from our perspective that as the movement grew, it was eventually co-opted by various misleaders or even the Democratic Party who flipped the script from defund to get out the vote, you know, for Joe Biden, essentially. Um, what is your assessment of what happened to that wonderful energy and inertia that the grassroots organizers and community built? And what is your assessment of the movement today and where it is that we or should be heading? Right, so that there's a lot in that question. So Liz, you have to remind me, you know, if I forget parts of it, because it's pretty complex what you're pointing to. So, uh, right when things jumped off, so to speak, because people were outraged and traumatized by terror, 
coming, you know, again, I keep saying this because, you know, we, I have to pay taxes, right? Um, we're paying the police to do what they do. And we're paying for their union's dues to protect them when they engage in violence against civilians, right? Uh, predatory violence. We are paying for their vacations, for their pensions, and for their overtime when they come out to crush movements. So it's always like you have to pay them time and a half, as I've said before, to beat you because you're protesting for human rights within what is supposed to be a functioning democracy. So I think it was the horror in which, the horrific conditions under which um, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd died that sparked the conscience of not just the US, but people around the globe. But, you know, sparks are not the same thing as a continuous flame, right? It's a spark. So stuff will flare up. And then there were different politics at play. Some people were like, we get to take out a police precinct. Other people like, no, we're going to hand out flowers. It's like the whole range. But for me, the most important thing was that they were articulating their grief through politics tied for love for community or the possibility of community without being treated as prey, right? That is hard to sustain without organizing. So you can have a movement, right? But movements happen after sustained organizing when a catalyst occurs. So in our lifetime, it was George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. For those of us who are older, we remember, we go further back, right? There are other folks. It could have been Malcolm, it could have been Martin, right? Mega Evers, if you wanna think internationally, Patrice Lumumba, 63. Amil Cabral, 1973, Chris Hani, 1993, like there's something about that, it's three thing that's going on right across the decades, but it's always the police forces because we've seen death in civilian life. You know, like some of us have family members who got in the underground economies, drug deals went wrong. You know, you lose a nephew, right? We've seen that, but the, our families and our communities did not swear an oath to protect us, even though they should. And we don't pay them to protect us, right? So there's a dishonor when these exterior forces that you have to pay for and then genuflect to in hopes that they don't beat you or disappear you or your kids, right? Through foster care, through you know, prison, through death row, you know, and you have this this honor roll list, right? of the names of political prisoners just as a feed, as a stream of a reminder, like, you know, again, awakens our consciousness. So a lot of people came out because they were horrified. People also came out because it was COVID, right? And they were exhausted and they understood themselves to have been abandoned. So I've said before in other, um, sectors or podcasts, whatever, that I was in Manhattan during that first wave. And this city went from 20 deaths in apartments daily to over 200 when COVID hit. And then they stopped giving us the numbers, right? And I, you know, my middle class academic life, I'm right in the middle between NYCHA, which is public housing, and the multi-million dollar condos and they just went to their second homes because they we're not doing this here right but there were sirens 24 hours a day so i'm sleep deprived but then that's making me pay attention and why are there sirens because they're constantly taking body bags out of buildings on the nitra side and that probably radicalized me as much as the protests against police violence and police murder that we are so disposable, right? And that no one is accountable for death by murder if it comes from the state or death by neglect if it comes from the state. And I think we're still grappling with not just, you know, COVID or we're adjusting to it, but I think we're grappling with those rebellions. I'm not sure we fully process them. I know younger people, you know, decades ago, I, I would be out, I'm not in hell. You know, you got kids, you're much older, you got health issues. So yeah, you can label me whatever, but I'll just say back in the day I was there, but now I just try to support. 
But I know the younger people who are out there and, you know, in terms of the NYPD, their position was their violence was orchestrated against police, I mean, against peaceful protesters, against police violence. And, you know, to be there with your girlfriend, your partner, and to see her head get cracked open, and then you can maybe make this sort of macabre joke, like, oh, we're going to pay down some bills when the settlement comes in. But to protest and to be a rebel is to, in, not to invite, but to understand there will be more repression. So I don't think it was just fatigue. I think it was just this hyper brutality from the cops that, again, we had to pay time and a half to beat the protesters, which legitimize the claim to shut it all down in terms of abolitionism. But we would have to have the staying power in the networks, both above ground and underground to sustain those kinds of demands. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and what, so what advice do you have for up and coming activists and how to, and how to address this? Yeah, that's that's a good one. I used to say I never give advice, but then people keep saying, what advice do you have? So I'm like, <laughs> okay, let me just wing it. Um, I was on something with Jared Ball, like his platform, I Mix What I Like, yesterday morning with Lorenzo Cabola Irving, right? The Black anarchist who was in the Panther Party, um, a militant underground, uh, ended up in Cuba, ended up being sent to Czechoslovakia, ended up being brought back to the U.S. and being incarcerated and tortured for years. But he talked about the evolution of becoming an anarchist after being a panther. And so in real time yesterday morning, I guess you can find this on Black Power Media, right? We're in this dialogue about, okay, what's next? Is what King would say, um, where do we go for here? And Lennon would say, what is to be done, right? So ride with King for a minute. Where do we go from here, chaos or community? We have to fortify community. And then at some point I started asking about mutual aid because not everybody's gonna trust, you know, anarchist concepts and not everybody understands them, including me. And they're multiple, right? Not every, very few people I know trust the Democratic Party, but they're still in play. And you still have a lot of black high profile activists that keeps like, let's just vote and this will get, you know, we had Obama, now we get Kamala. And then we have uh, the Supreme Court justice, but basically the structure is in tech and it reproduces itself. So the question that I posed to Mr. Irving or a couple were, do we have mutual aid in terms of sustaining the community? And he said that he didn't believe that we had a black mutual aid operation. Because even when I think of mutual aid, I'm thinking of mostly white leftists, young people, but you know, and it's not just white people, but then that becomes the, the image, the profile, right? But you think about, and I've seen black people too, Latino, um, Muslim, I mean, yeah, Asian, I've seen everybody, right? But he was saying this about anarchism. Like if you think it has quote white origins and that's definitely air quotes around that because it's all about communalism, right? And freedom, then some people shy away from it. So I think the community will allow us to organize in our own cultural frameworks, but at the time at which we need to connect and strengthen those connectors, we become a movement that has broad connections to all groups. So back to Irving, right? We would need to expand the mutual aid component. It's not just the fridge that has the food in the neighborhood, right? Or figuring out how to protect the unhoused when a black mayor like Eric Adams destroys all their encamp, not hundreds of encampments. I mean, New York City is not even efficient except when it wants to move against impoverished people when they're dispossessed, then they're like, they, you know, it's the trains will run on time kind of thing, right? And if we can take care of these needs, the housing, the food, and for academics like me, who are for whatever reasons not out there on the corner, then we tithe, right? We write checks, we help fund, um, I did say, I'm going to refer again to yesterday morning because it, there was a lot of debate and I think it's relevant to what some of the issues are that you're putting on the table, Ryan. I did make a statement about, well, if there's $40 million 
dollar surplus in the Black Lives Matter Global Network or something. Like, why not just ask for that and have the money redistributed? I, I said 30 states, it could be three. I don't know, I don't care. But, you know, buy some brownstones or some buildings, create some gardens, right? Understand um, in a material way that the money that got flooded in by corporations that are also anti-worker, like Jeff Bezos and company. So we'll make you poor individually, but we're gonna give all this money that we could have just like, you know, shared with workers. We're gonna give it as a high profile PR thing, right? But to distribute these funds to stabilize our zones. And I see the need for housing as you see it. I see the need for reliable food sources and, and food that's healthy as you see it. I also see the need, I was listening to Joyce McMillan on a webinar a couple of days ago to keep our children with us, not to let the foster care industry do human trafficking. Okay, did I go over the top with that one? I don't know. I mean, there's a money mechanism caught up in child removal, just as there is an incarceration labor exploitation. People wouldn't be into this unless they could make money out of it, right? So I find, because I've organized with different sectors, right, over the decades, I find that we have to meet people's material needs. And we understand that it's linked to the political structures that have to be abolished. But it's not sufficient just to you know make the call to tear down the structure because it becomes what you've said it just becomes a reformist act because they have the money to flood in or they have the influencers to tell you like oh you need to stand down on this one and be more agreeable and maybe you know be more vulnerable and i i support vulnerability because it, it makes us sentient beings but i don't support vulnerability as like the first, you know, step forward towards a predator. Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of what you're talking about, you know, recently was on my mind in the sense that my partner and I, we just came back from Colombia and we mm -hmm. went to Palenque, uh, which was considered the first, um, the first community of freed the, uh, uh, African slaves. Um, in in the americas and right. i was and i was thinking of maroonage and mm -hmm. and how how can how can we envision maroonage in in 2022 in the 21st century and i think your discussion of mutual aid presents some options because of the co-opting that exists of non through nonprofits through for profits and so there have to be spaces outside of the of that sphere um, yeah. But I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on no, that. No, no, you, I think you, 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 you're point on, spot on, right? I mean, the, I raised Maranage in our discussion yesterday morning. And so Mr. Irving said autonomous zones. I kind of, you know, I don't know if he, like you say, you know, tomato, I say tomato, whatever. But I'm sure there are differences between the two. But we have to have zones that we can protect against the state and corporation. And particularly to go back to the integrity of family. And family is not just biological, right? It's like emotional, it's kin, it's your comrade. You know, we have all kinds of partners, right? And we have all kinds of people we care for. The elder, the child, you know, the trees, the water. I mean, your family is what keeps you alive and makes your life meaningful. But I would say, you know, this is the thing that I was thinking about land because I'd also been talking to the Weekville co-op, some of the younger people on the board, and that's in Brooklyn. And so that was one of the first, they were educating me. I love it when 27 year olds are like, we're gonna teach you something, right? But that was one of the first black free um, communities in the 19th century. And so somehow in New York, which is like the international port for trafficking, right? In terms of the US, um, you know, because the ships come in, you know, people get, sold and distributed to different places and stuff um, and traumatized and terrorized um, in the making of the slave to create a capitalist economy that they managed to stay free as blacks and not be re-enslaved and, and also to protect those who were enslaved. So I'm also thinking when I heard, listened to Brad Lopez 
uh, indigenous, I believe, oh, I don't want to misname their nation. Uh, it's Niren Gasset or Lanapa, I think it's Niren Gasset, but talk about Martha's Vineyard that we think of really expensive, like real estate, right? But centuries ago, right, the that was the indigenous homeland and they would help enslaved Africans go to the island and it would be almost impossible to find because they're on a, you know, you have to, you could see the ship coming, right, to do the hunt. And so there are ways in which we have the history and the legacy of creating maroon sites. And I think this goes to, I've said this to a couple of folks, you know, I understand the gravity, the weight of anti-Blackness. But I also understand that revolutionary struggle will not include all Black people because not all Black people want to be revolutionary. Some of them are anti-revolutionary and some of them are counter-revolutionary, right? Like, you know, we work with the FBI, the CIA, we're commander in chief. I mean, we're, we're going to maintain the state as empire. But when I think then of these formations, maroon formations, they have a culture themselves about escape, preservation, protection, and expansion. Will they be hunted? Absolutely. And the hunt doesn't mean always somebody rolls up with military, you know, weaponry. The hunt could be like, oh, we've got a grant for you. Or would you like to come talk to our foundation? And then we'll take you on tour, or would you like to write this book to explain yourself? And then that becomes another form of purchase. So when I talk about the Captain Maternal, I mentioned this before, I was on a forum, LGBTQ plus forum, and I was talking about self-defense, like how Black trans teens needed to be supported because of the murder rates against Black trans women, right? And the notion of self-defense though was giving pause. And so the conversation died out. And I was like, okay, this is the anniversary of Attica. Let me try it another way. And I said, there are stages. Like first we're complicit because we're trustees in the structure. We reproduce it by being the good workers. And it's not like we want to do it, but like, you know, you need to feed your kids or literally in prison, they can torture you, put you in lockdown, deny you food, et cetera, et cetera. Then we move to the protest zone, right? Like this is not humane. We're humans, however you want to call yourselves. Um, we write petitions, et cetera, et cetera. Then you move to the third stage, which is mobilization, which is what we saw in the streets. But the fourth stage would be maronage. And so when I read Attica, it's when they took over the prison and they built an encampment within the fortress of the prison, you know, medical center, media center, political education, culture, food delivery, waste removal, et cetera. They created an autonomous zone inside of a prison. And of course the state saw that as war. And when they took it over, they killed a number of people. And as Orsami Burton has written in his book that happily will be coming out soon, they also, uh, they killed leaders after they'd retaken the prison. So, that shouldn't deter us, you know, infiltration, um, you know, misdis, you know, you know, directing us misdirection, right, in another zone, or even the violence of if this is an encampment, like the NYPD did, you know, at the behest of Mayor Adams, right, to break up these zones. I think it's this is all we've got is this quest for autonomy. At the same time, and this is what Mr. Irving was saying, and I agreed, we have to think as internationalists and we have to think as anti-capitalists. But I would hope, right, that our understanding of ourselves would mean that we have the capacity to imagine, not just, you know, theoretically, but also to build materially upon that imagination, that we create zones that we could stabilize ourselves and then create these organizational networks that allow us to go forward. Yeah, and, and that leads me to my next question, which um, which is about pragmatism. You know, in, in August 2021, you were on Two Black Show, the, the Black Myths podcast, discuss, yeah. discussing some myths that have been created around Angela Davis. Um, mm -hmm. And toward the, towards the end of your conversation on the show, you discussed how pragmatism and social change are kind of sort of at odds with each other. Um, and I, 
I'll also put the link um, to that episode in the description of this. Um, but can you explain to us some of the limits of pragmatism? Because when you think of, like you discuss Attica um, and their rebellion, they clearly weren't trying to be pragmatic, you know? Um, no, they were trying to, well, you know, and they weren't even, this is my read on it, right? They were, it wasn't an escape thing, right? It wasn't like the political prisoners, you know, Maroon Schultz or Kowezi Balagun, right? For, you know, fortunately, we bury our people too soon and under the worst conditions. But um, that was practical and pragmatic for them, even though they weren't trying to be pragmatic. Does that make sense? Like, who even gets to define the term? See, I was pushing against it as a disciplinary or disciplinarian move, right? That, you know, you are you need to grow up. Your politics are infantile, unless you want to do dreams, and then that's, like, permissible. But anything else, meaning a political act, would not be. So let me, let me take a detour and then come back to it. So after Floyd was murdered, and I was still in the city, right? I was listening to WBAI. So I'm glad you have your, your news podcast information. I mean, I think this is going to be the life, the pulse of keeping us together is that you, everybody's like radiating it out. We need to talk, right? And creating these platforms so we can talk. But there is a black pastor in Rochester speaking on, on WBAI. And he said, um, after Floyd's murder, which was horrific. And it was a lynching. It was so spectacular and over the top. I mean, if you want to kill somebody, it's, there's easier ways to do it and in privacy, right? And especially if you want to walk and, and keep your job. But um, the pastor said, and I'm sorry, I don't, I didn't catch his name. If you kill us, we will kill your economy. Now, some people say that's not pragmatic, but I was like, yeah, I will like give up kombucha. I mean, just tell me what I need to do. Like, I will not buy any more clothes. I have sewing machines. Like, so tell me what the plan is. But we're so overextended um, and on, and sometimes siloed that we don't have the connectors to make those plans. But I would, you know, again, I see it as a general strike. If other people don't like the verb, we can change the verb. But we we will, if your God is money, we will mess up the mechanisms in which you pray, okay? So if you love making money, whatever Elon Musk is doing or think he's doing with, you know, Twitter, we will just, we will freeze things, right? In terms of economic growth and stability. And if we have built our gardens, and if we do know how to take care of each other and ourselves, right? And like create pods or homeschools or freedom schools for our kids, we can survive we can survive those large, impressive acts that are considered to be not practical. So like, I think the language of pragmatism, I know there's John Dewey and other people, but I think the language of pragmatism in liberation movements is overplayed. Liberation movements are always strategic, which means they're always pragmatic because you're doing cost, you know, calculations here, right? We're not, all you know running towards the barricades or something like you know jump off something whatever it's just it's strategic or we wouldn't be able to organize that is what organizing is organizing itself is a pragmatic endeavor but now you tell me about the goals if you're telling me the goals and the ambitions have to be pragmatic and that the definition of pragmatic comes from influencers and the state and large nonprofit corporations and the corporate media, then you're just, you're selling me something that's not real. I mean, I could do real drugs rather than just do this, right? So if it's like, so when you get to the end of the podcast, I start laughing because I, I really appreciate those young folks, right? I don't want to misgender them, but I just say the young brothers, right? Because they're pushing me, like, you need to, well, like, tell us about, like, they come back to the question three, four times. And like, okay, so I get it. So people think I'm not pragmatic, you know, even though I could keep a job for decades. So, you know, not, no shame on anybody who, like, walked out or doesn't want the job. But it's just like, obviously, if I'm still where I am, then I have some kind of notion of what limits might be and still will work to transgress them. So I'm laughing. I said, okay, so now you want, we're, we're going to close on pragmatism. 
we can't really close on it because the pragmatic, I believe, happens in organizing and we're not organizing, we're just having a conversation. But when you go back to your crew, figure out what is strategic and what is in line, aligned with your ethics. Because I feel people sell out their ethics and their commitment to communities in order to be practical. For me, that's stage one of the captive maternal. I have to put food on the table. So I'm gonna make my kids go to this like really fancy school where they're gonna call them like the N word, you know, once a month or simple. You know, it's you're still harming your kids. You're forcing them to integrate into harmful structures. We've all been forced to integrate into predatory zones. So the question is, how do we get out, even if we get one foot out? So on one level, I start thinking of like Sam Greeley's The Spook Who Sat By The Door. Like you infiltrate, you re redirect resources out. And again, it could be money, it could be connections. It, it doesn't always have to look like the film, which you know the FBI, I believe, disappeared. And there was one copy in a vault and it's the only reason we can see it today. But at the end of the day, what I was trying to talk about was love. So you mentioned, or I shared, there's a book coming out uh, in August or September called In Pursuit of Revolutionary Love. And it wasn't even my idea. It's feminists from Europe, from UK reached out and said, you know, like what you're doing, these podcast conversations, we'd like to hear more. And then what I did is, you know, fortunately it's too late for this conversation, is like we transcribe the conversations with the community. So what you're doing, what um, Two Black and Ryan are doing, a Black Miss, right? What Millennials are killing capitalism. What I mix, what I like, Black Power. Me. We transcribe those conversations, and they will appear in the book. And they're very practical, but they're also ambitious. You can have pragmatic people who just give up, and then their claim to fame is that they're pragmatic, right? But the ambition to be free or to live with clean water, clean air, to not see people beat down or snuffed out, that will push you beyond pragmatism. That's just like step one. We have to keep moving. And so then I end up saying to, um, to Black and Ryan, I mean, the only people you respect, and they didn't tell me I was wrong, are the people who weren't pragmatic. You only respect the people who love that they sacrifice so much. And like, I think always it made me till Mobley. Is it pragmatic to have an open casket funeral for a 14 year old mutilated teen? No, but when she did that, she triggered an entire movement. And is it pragmatic to bring your like six year old and make them look in the coffin so like they have nightmares for the next two years? I don't know, what's the definition? If the definition, I need my kid not to be lynched, so we're gonna like just jump this off right now, then that becomes pragmatic in itself, but that's not the standard definition. There is nothing that will free you that is mundane. The only thing that will free you is what you love beyond the practical everyday routine of reproducing yourself. And that, I, I don't believe I'm the only one. If I were, there would be no Malcolm, no more. I like all those people. And that, that feed you have going underneath this discussion, there wouldn't be a feed because nobody loved us enough to risk everything to try to contribute to our freedom. Hmm. Um, thank you for saying that. And that leads perfectly to the next question, which is that one of the things, there are a few issues that, are, that the show really tries to highlight um, and center. Um, and one of those is the importance of centering the, the fight to free political prisoners in the U.S. Um, and so... And I think it's something that's lacking in in many of the movements that are that that we at least in the U.S. Um, that the discussion of the importance. I mean, you hear about it more in um, and from Palestinians, but I just don't hear about it at least from my contemporaries and those that are younger than me. Um, so, can you tell us what is the importance of continuing to fight to free all political prisoners in the U.S. and why is it important to center them in any liberation movement? Yeah. Right. Okay. So I'm going to take a step back and do a connector to the Black Myths podcast. So it, it's called, I think the title is Myth, and it was two parts, right? So the 
the collective did their part and then they asked me to do the second part or part two, right? So it was uh, Davis the Black Panther. And so they say it's a myth, but I wanna also put on the table, Davis says that she was. So then it gets complicated. And I would argue that her being a political prisoner based on a relationship to the Black Panther, it's really Soledad brother, right? Cause it's Jonathan Jackson and George Jackson. And Jonathan Jackson wasn't a Panther, but it's the fact that she was a political prisoner, right? And George, I believe was field marshal for the Panthers. That is why you had a huge movement come out for her. It was like people were concerned when she wasn't rehired at UCLA to teach philosophy because she was a member of the Communist Party USA, but it was because she was a political prisoner that there's a global movement. So people can't tell you that political prisoners are not catalysts for our consciousness and our mobilization. I would just argue that in the 50 years since that happened, you know, the traumatic event happened to her. And actually I do side with blackness because now I'm confused about the narrative, who's a Panther, who's not, right? But I understand the, the relevance of the Panthers is that they are the symbolic register for the rebel. So if you say you're a Panther, then you're out of, no matter what you do, you get to be a rebel, right? Even though that's not really technically how it's supposed to work. Um, the political prisoners we have, I mentioned earlier, like how, their care, they had strategies. We all wouldn't agree with all those strategies, right? But the political prisoners, and this, I'm sorry, I'm thinking this out because this is like, you know, I've been anthologizing. Well, I started years ago. This is going to be a bit of a ramble because I'm trying to answer this question and it's really, really challenging. Like, I know that we need to commit to them, but I'm trying to explain why it's absolutely essential. And it's not just, even though it is significant, of course, that they're being caged and tortured, but this is not about their victimization per se. It is about their agency and their intellectualism and what they stand for. So now I've got to backtrack a minute. So how I got, became active was, you know, I've said it in other places. I knew Davis from organizing, not from the academy. I don't follow academics, even though I respect them, you know, and I do have some friends who are academics. Um, but I'd known Davis, I had a postdoc, I took it to Santa Cruz, I got introduced to abolitionism, did this conference in Colorado, did an anthology, got Palgrave to, I acknowledge that they'll mail 50 copies in because I knew the Panthers in Harlem and nobody from the abolitionist formal crew had invited anybody who was a Panther, but because I knew the Harlem people, Panthers came um, to the conference in Colorado and I was put in touch with Jalil Muntakin. So, and he got out a couple of years ago, he served 49 years. So I mail him an anthology. He writes a very polite letter, but it's like, this is not relevant. Like academics, and even if you have star power here, you really don't know what the conditions are like and your political analysis is off. So when I went to Brown, I spent eight years anthologizing. And that for me, well, that's one of the reasons why I'm no longer at Brown, but that for me became a school to interact with the political prisoners, to have to like read and understand like the choices and the analyses and the commitments and the risk-taking love, right? We don't know what it means to seek freedom at the cost for the edge of rebellion unless we read and study the political prisoners. We don't know the full extent of the violence of a predatory imperial state unless we read political prisoners. We don't know about betrayal, about how you could suffer and sacrifice and then people forget about you for decades, but then somehow you pop up in a book, right? or at a conference, you know, or you're in some, you know, documentary, whatever, like that you become the commodity that has, there's a market, right? 
And it wasn't the case when I was at Brown because, you know, people were like, you need to go. We don't do this kind of thing. But it's definitely the case now. Like there's been a, there's a commodities market, I would argue, for Black suffering. And that's like been in the making for centuries. But I also believe there's a commodities market around rebels who are committed to communities. It's not just rebelling because you, you're some kind of libertarian or something. Um, I'm thinking Koch brothers, libertarian, not, you know, the radical libertarians. Um, I can say for myself, I didn't really understand politics until I started reading, anthologizing, writing letters, and then worrying. You know, I think I've said this before, you know, I'm writing to Marilyn Buck and she's got cancer. I'm writing to Berrigan and he's inside and he's got cancer. It could be like people who are in the underground or people who were plowshare pacifists. I didn't know the full range of my emotional commitment to community or freedom until I became engaged with political prisoners. And I didn't understand fully the limitations of my agency until I, you know, became involved with political prisoners. And so it's, it, there's not going to be anything romantic. Um, there's a current campaign now with Mumia called Love Not Fear. You know, I respect that. I, I think the way I'm thinking of the pursuit of revolutionary love might be a little different, but there's heart everywhere. There's heart everywhere. I mean, there's knowledge, there's vulnerability, there's fierceness, there's inc incredible tenacity, just principled, principled behavior, refusing to be broken after decades of torture. And again, I say I could never, you know, but I'm not even trying, right, to be anything like them. I'm just trying to learn and to show up. And that's why we need them for what they did in the past, even when we disagree. And there's some acts I was like, now I wouldn't have as a strategist or, you know, we could talk about a lot of critiques, which are not even relevant, right, in this moment, but we have the right to critique. This is not a fan club. This is not a cult. This is a community. And we're part of the community and they're part of our communities. So it's imperative that we do what we do for family. You don't, even if you don't like your family member, you don't abandon them. It's family and they are teachers. And are teachers perfect? Absolutely not. I mess up on a regular basis when I do my classes, right? Because I'm short-sighted, I have my contradictions, et cetera, et cetera. That's true of all of us, but they have the knowledge that is, is absolutely um, prophetic. And I went to seminary, so I get to say that because I had to do time in seminary. So I would say, you know, one person who comes to mind who's been out for years is Deruba, right? And so decades ago when he was just coming out, because, you know, I know I knew some Harlem people in the party, um, they're like, you was going to come to UMass. And so it's like, yeah, you could stay at my house and everything like that. But that was probably, that's in the 90s. That was probably my first introduction. But also I was in women's studies. So people saw that as a weird contradiction when actually it wasn't because I was teaching the memoirs of, you know, Davis, who was a strong ally. Okay, she said she was in the party, but I know her as a strong ally, right, in those early years. Um, and Asada. Um, there, you know, there is a way in which it doesn't matter what your your community of choice might be, whether it's feminist, whether it's queer, LGBTQ, you know, trans, whether it's environmental. Because I also remember from Colorado when my affluent white students were like, "We're going to miss some classes," and I'm like, you know, which why your affluent white people like? Do you guys have problems? Oh yeah, they do. They're like, yeah, we have to meet with the FBI in Denver because our friends are in ELF, the Earth Liberation Front. And they kind of want us to turn on them. <laughs> so I, was like, I was like, oh, you take as much time as you want. Like, you know, don't worry about your paper. It's not due anytime soon. Because 
I was learning from not having met their friends directly, but I was learning from their connectors to their friends, right? That they were fighting against predatory behavior on every metric. And that's what political prisoners do. And there were people who just torch cars, right? And, you know, the cars were insured. And I'm not saying you should go torch a car, you know, at a car lot. But that whole eco-terrorist thing that the FBI just created, like the ex extremity, what black extremist identity index, whatever. I mean, people sit at desks and they create things. They put that young person away for decades. And I would just like, you know, you, you're gonna be insured and do community service. I mean, literally, that's what I would say. You're gonna to need to plant some trees, you know, maybe wipe down some cars, whatever, or like talk to people about like hybrid cars or electric, but it's the state's violence against us. And I always, I know I'm taking a long time to get there, but I'm treating this as free therapy. It's our state's violence against us. And I need to look over my shoulder and say, oh yeah, they're political prisoners. We need to get them out because I know that someone jumped in front and created a barrier or tried to between the state's predatory violence and the community. That someone offered security, even, you know, the plan wasn't the plan maybe, as I said, I said, should ask the community what kind of security they wanted, but they cared. And so we need to reciprocate that care, particularly since they're elders. And the last thing, Ryan, they're new political prisoners. Like I've heard from the young people, there are people from Ferguson who are inside. There are also people who ended up shot and were found in burning cars. There's also a mother who is an activist in Ferguson. I saw her in Chicago in 2019 in November at the refounding of the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Um, it's now headed by Frank Chapman, who's absolutely brilliant, who also did time, you know, as a black Marxist Leninist activist. But at this forum, I mean, the mother talks about finding her 20 something year old son who's just studying from his real estate exam, hanging from a tree lynched in her yard. And she feel, you know, she reads that clearly as an attack on the mother through the child. So if we're gonna protect our communities, they include political prisoners. We do not survive without protection. And if we are to protect ourselves, we have to imagine strategies that are not so predictable or so aligned with the state and the corporate nonprofit apparatus. Yeah, thank you for saying all that. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, it's something I, I continually try to highlight. I try to have as many guests on. Um, I, had, I had Jaleel Mutakin on um, to highlight this this concept um, that, that we really need to center political prisoners. Another topic which you, you kind of hinted at at the beginning, and um, huge shout out to you for men mentioning Joyce McMillan. Um, she is one of... Uh, my many idols um, and someone I work with closely um, is is the is the concept of the family policing system, which the oppressor mm -hmm. often refers to as the child welfare system. Um, as we discussed earlier in in the spring and summer of 2021, there was this huge call to defund the police, uh, to abolish the police and the prison industrial complex. But unfortunately, many aren't aware of their genocidal partner in crime, the family policing system. Uh, for those that may not be aware, um, can you explain to us what the family policing system is and how do you think we build and connect it more effectively to the broader kind of defund, abolish prison industrial complex, like abolish yeah. prison industrial complex movement? I think it's key. I mean, hmm. There's, no, there's nothing more important, for those of us who have children, even those who don't, there's nothing more important than our children. We would die for them and some of us would kill for them. So like, that's just how deep it gets. Does it mean the families are always well-adjusted or they have enough resources or 
you know, parents working multiple jobs or, you know, kids having their own stressors. No, we're imperfect, but we love. And our charges are the children. And I would also say the elders, when they become more frail too, it's, it's those who are the most vulnerable to a predatory state. Those are the people that you encircle, right? And protect. And somehow the issue of children gets siloed, right? Because there's going to be this shame about the mother. And Joyce is McMillan, I want to give her full name, absolutely brilliant. And when I'm listening to her like earlier this week speak, and then later, you know, I'm talking to Irvin, you know, yesterday morning. So I had a, a rich week. It was exhausting, but I'm like, oh, these brillant warriors, right? Joyce McMillan started reminding me of an anarchist because she won't conform. And she was talking about your rights. You don't have to open the door. You don't have to let people in. But also just white supremacy is shot through everything, as is accumulation, right? So I am grew up like conservative. Like I said, I, I'm not coming to this from the left. I'm coming to it from the right. I mean, I was socialized on military bases with like an intelligence officer, right? So that gives you a pretty jacked up childhood. But, you know, I'm still here, right? But one of the things that I, I realized, right? And I was saying that because I'm going back to Texas. That was the parental family side was Texas. The maternal side was Mississippi. So they're, both of those states are hardcore for different reasons, right? For Black people. Um, in Texas, I got a bit involved, right? With trying to be helpful with some of the mothers. And what I saw was a re, I mean, I wasn't there in the 19th century, but it seemed like kind of familiar in terms of the template. The way in which they could snatch a child and in, an, in effect, sell it. I mean, it becomes state property. Maybe it's more like the convict prison lease system than chattel slavery where you have a private owner because now the child belongs to the state. And then you could put the kid anywhere. And then they can threaten, you know, the parent with the legal aspect, with the drug testing, with further incarceration and stuff like that. It's only the parents who have money to lawyer up and who are socialized by affluent white people who just like, you, you seriously want to play that with me, right? But I mean, that's like rare. That's like the black unicorn, we're, you know, kind of roaming around with everything else, right? And so that was my introduction. And the interesting thing, because I was a visiting prof at UT, and I was just trying to be relevant and helpful, but the people I ended up doing battle with were middle-class white women who were graduate from UT Austin's social work school. And I was like, oh my God, you're, you're accomplices, right? I mean, because the language is we're here to help and care and protect families, but I just watched them like, Wow, just, I don't even have the words for it. I'm still traumatized. Like, just like scorch earth families. And I would sit in some of those courtrooms and just watch. And as I think it was Dorothy Roberts had said on the webinar with uh, Joyce McMillan, you know, you sit in court and it's only black families. And actually that's what I was doing. I was sitting in court trying to be supportive. And it was like all black families except for it was black and some latino right because this is texas and one white woman who had a black child so if she'd had a black you know it's just a white woman who just had a white father you wouldn't be up in this right and i was sitting there and it was a latina i'm just going to share this story because damn i gotta go do more yoga now right but it's sort of like the mother, the mother has a mother, the grandmother, the children, and they don't have money. So what are they doing? She's running a meth lab, but they make sure the kids are safe and they're not near, you know, this stuff should be decriminalized, but whatever. They make sure the kids are safe. The social worker shows up at the house of the mother and she's just sort of parked outside till really late and comes back really early in the morning and realizes that the mother and her two, three kids never came back, a young mother in her 20s. 
Where were they? The, the children went to see their grandmother. And this judge, man, he's like, you, you let the children see their grandmother. You knew the grandmother was involved in the underground economy. You sit right there. You don't move. And then he orders some kind of, you know, social worker cop to go get all three kids out of elementary school. And I'm sitting in the back freaking out because you can't say anything because they throw you out, right? And it was like, wait, we tell our kids, don't ever leave anywhere with a stranger. You're sending somebody these kids never met to pull them out of kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, disappear them from their mother. And the mother's like, can I just call? Can I explain? And they're like, no, just sit there. She sits there. She's sobbing. You can hear her sobbing while he goes next case and reads another number. I was, because I'm an academic and because I'm middle class, like I try to avoid certain zones, right? Because it is, it is when the state will destroy everything you love, break your children, throw their broken bodies or spirits back at you. And I, I'm just being honest about my tolerance, but there was no way I could like walk out just to escape her sobbing. Like, you know, we're all gonna be a witness to this. And the thing is, she was only trying to keep the family together. And that is prohibited for us, which is why we don't owe the state anything. Because the only thing they ever wanted was family and familial love and community love. And if you're going to keep trashing that, even the Texan, the, the governor, who is like a Republican, he admitted they created this little commission called disproportionality. Black families are no more dysfunctional than Latino or Mexicano, Mexicana, or uh, white families. They just remove them at a higher rate. But they do it with such contempt and dishonor because they want to break the spirit of the parent. It's not about child safety. Yeah, there are some moments the child definitely is not safe here. But then you ask a relative or you ask the church or you ask, like, can y'all take care of this family while we help the parents stabilize? That's not what it, it's, a, it's, not what it's about. It, it is about devastation. And there's certain things that should not exist. And that's probably includes social workers. So again, if we could reproduce autonomous zones or maroon camps where you can see a family is stressing and spiraling out, the mother or the father needs a break. They need food. The kids need like, you, you want to go for a walk. You want to do basketball. You want to like watch a movie. I think we should build enclosures and keep the state out. The state harms us more than it helps, and it makes money out of harm. So I don't know if that was helpful, but I think you should check out Joyce McMillan. Like, I'm not really organized in this zone. I just like have, you know, some experiences that I witnessed or in ways I tried to help. But she's actually building a movement. And it is not, quote, pragmatic, except if it's pragmatic to save children. So again, if we're going to define pragmatism as we need to save our children, our communities, I will be a pragmatic. If you're telling me to like compromise and not rebel, there's no way I can do that and, and, and not, you know, have self-loathing like, more than I already have. Yeah, and, and thank you for saying that. And and I I do work closely with Joyce um, and J Mac for Families is is her organization, and um, you know she's really um, kind of the at the on the front lines of the family, what, what some call the family defense movement, um, really trying to take down the family policing system, and a huge inspiration for for everyone involved. Um, I would love to be in touch with her if ever. I mean. I could be useful or, you know, whatever. I just so admire this work that y'all are doing because like I've seen it up close. I've seen other people, you know, they're adults now, but they went through the system. There's incredible amounts of harm and children are so, 
they're like sponges. They just absorb everything and they deserve everything. So they can't like, you can't let them do the toxins, which is, you know, coming out of the state. And all the, also, you know, the state owes us everything, but it won't give anything. So we'll have to like break it down. You know, I mean, we keep paying for it. I can't believe like I'm paying for social workers as well as cops, as well as also bad psychiatrists, therapists who just like over med kids. They just drug them up, right? They stick them in these residential schools. They abuse them. These are all zones that are carceral. And the beauty of life is the freedom to grow within it, even while you make mistakes, but you have the support of a community that can help you deal with aggression, including our own internal aggressions against ourselves and our aggressions as civilians against others. I think that we're all willing to make that move towards those zones but we still have a lot of fear and not maybe enough trust in ourselves that we could build those zones. Yeah, and I will definitely connect you with Joyce and, and our mutual friend Ayami um, is working with Joyce. She recently had a promotion or uh, in, in JMAC for, for families, but I can't recall her title, um, but I will I will connect the two of you. Yeah, Ayami's my, I mean, yeah. I, <laughs> See, that's a good thing, right? Like, cause you never know what happens when you're in these classrooms and you think it's like all talk, talk. And then like the kids, you know, they're not kids, but the young adults bust out of schools, meaning, you know, they graduate or they don't, they walk. But then they do these incredible things. Like they, they transcend the limitations of the elders, which is what is supposed to happen. I mean, we're not supposed to be lecturing to them all day and all night. I mean, they're rebuilding the world, so. Yeah, but when you were, sorry. No, I was just going to say, yay, Ayame, and all those crews out there, yeah. Yeah, when you were just discussing um, the ACS's harm in removing children, or the, the government's harm in removing children, I was hearing Ayame's voice when you were listing the, the various descriptions. Ayame would characterize it as a form of violence by, on the part of the state. And so I was hearing Ayame's, Ayame saying that, that this is an act of violence against against the family. Uh, yeah, but it, I'm glad you said that, right? Because I keep using the descriptor, it's a predatory state. I know people call it racial capitalism, which is all true, but sometimes that language becomes a bit abstract in my mind, you know, because it's like this these large containers. But I just say predator, predator prey, and then it breaks it down. And, and that's what I said on the Black Miss podcast when we talk about primatism. You know, you wouldn't let a a predator roam through the kindergarten class with your kids in it, would it? Mm -mm. So, I mean, just because they're a teacher that's pragmatic because they're like unionized, so no. I mean, you would just like, no, you need to leave and get some help, but you're not around the kids, right? So that uh, for me, it's like, let's just be consistent across the board. You need to leave, leave the children alone. We'll figure it out and we're gonna need, right? The churches, the mosques, right? The synagogues, the Buddhist centers, like all the spiritual, I don't want, yeah, therapeutic means different things, but we don't need the state. We don't need the state because that's not what it's engineered for. It's engineered for accumulation, for domination, and for violence. And if you, you want to look at the kids, or you could just look at the natural environment and look what the state like did to it, like selling mm -hmm. it all, drilling, like doing all this other stuff. And the other thing, I mean, I think some ways maybe, I'm not a psychoanalyst or anything like that, you know, but I respect the AP people who like go into that territory, which I don't comprehend. But um, we've inherited a lot. So, you know, if you think about the secret burials of the indigenous children, like, you know, Canada is right, gonna write a check for 3 billion and then they're gonna skim off the top with their bureaucratic stuff and lawyers. Or you think about the thousands of indigenous women and girls who are missing or black girls and women or children missing. 
there's a lot of trafficking and violence against the most vulnerable, the neural atypical. This is, the zone itself has been corrupted by violence because it, it created its infrastructure, right? At a genocide. So that's what we've inherited. So like, how do you reclaim a zone that has been structured and amplified and projected globally, right? That its seeds were, were a genocide of violence, destruction of cultures, language, peoples, right? And it's not like you can't do it. It's just, it's just, it's just that if this then becomes the purpose of our lives, however we choose to contribute to this, it's not just an endeavor, it's a mission. It cannot be achieved unless we will discipline ourselves to connect with each other. And I think this is why I was asking Mr. Irvin, I kept using the word connectors over and over again, that I would discipline myself. You know, there's things I don't want to do. There's people I don't want to be around, but I would discipline myself if we were more adamant and also more bold. I feel like sometimes we're like critiquing and snarking, but we don't put demands. Like I would say, just ask for the 40 million, right? And then, you know, use it for like corporate attorneys or something to. You hit mute. You're on, you're on mute, Dr. James. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. No problem. So one of the things, I'm looking for boldness at this point. Joyce McMillan is bold for me. I'm like, I mean, I could listen to her all day because she's clear, she's bold, she has experiential knowledge. She's like survived the suffering. She's offering leadership and not everybody's going to be a leader like that. I don't, that's not my thing. Like I read, I analyze, you know, I'll write some stuff. But I think we should, I think how, I know we're mobilized now, but I think we should start connecting our, our, our zones. I think we should start connecting our zones and we should start preparing. Cause you know, I can't, I can't, I, you know, I grew up on military bases and maybe I should stop saying that over and over again, but I still try to figure it out. Like, what does that mean? But I was saying this, you know, at this kind of more like academic thing, I think it was Princeton, right? And they wanted me to talk about home. And I was like, oh yeah. So during the Contra Wars, I was in Latin America and I visited a refugee camp for the Salvadorans and they've been mutilated by machetes, right? And then I recognized like we paid for that because that was Reagan funding terror, right? And my tax dollars, I was not old enough to really be paying taxes. But then I was like, wait, so Fort Benning, Georgia, what was that called? And you know, the activists called it the School of Assassins, but it was School of Americas. And I was like, I was learning how to play kickball there. And I was like, oh my God, I was playing kickball in the same territory where they were training death squads. So maybe home should be something you burn down. I literally said that. I guess like not all kind of homes should survive. And like, we don't have to literally burn it down for anybody like, okay, figuratively, right? But maybe there's a departure. I started to talk about the unnomadic tradition that sometimes you have to leave. And it's really time to leave the empire. It doesn't mean to like completely lose your job and your house go, broke, can't feed your kids. It just means that whatever that psychological, emotional, like at least this is a stable shelter and we can accumulate something. It's time to let go of that because the clearest impression I have of it now is that we get to play kickball or whatever, or Netflix, and it's doing its version of engineering death squads. And it, the death squad could be that you killed a family because you took the children and then you put them somewhere and they were abused, if not physically, sexually, emotionally, and psychologically. You took the parent and you put them in prison, right? Because they had a substance issue. It's like some things should not remain. Or if they do remain, we should not seek 
that enclosure to shelter within it. And so now we have to build because you can't have your kids play kickball in the same zone that's training death squads. Um, and do you have time for two more questions? I know I've had you on for a while. Sure, uh, yeah. Okay, I just wanna be respectful of your time. Mm -hmm. um, I think speaking of the importance of, of connectedness um, and also looping back to something you mentioned earlier regarding something uh, you said Lorenzo Kamboa Irving talked about was the importance of kind of internationalism and Pan-Africanism, two concepts I also try to promote on the show because again, my contemporaries and those younger than me I don't feel like talk about the importance of having an internationalist consciousness. Um, and so I wanted to see what your thoughts were on why Pan-Africanism and, inter and internationalism is important to any struggle today for liberation. Yeah, I mean, it's imperative. I mean, you can't go anywhere without them, right? And I understand, and again, like anarchism, I'm not well versed in it, I'm trying to learn more. And you can say I came late to the game. I don't have a problem. I'm at least I'm trying to show up. There's distinctions between Black internationalism and Pan-Africanism. And it's better that those people in those zones um, articulate those differences than I try to do it as an academic. I did send you the link to the conference that's happening in July. And maybe people, I mean, maybe Leader Ryan, you might want to like throw a shout out about it and give the info, but maybe people could, you know, participate. I think Jared Ball is going to be part of it, a number of other people. It's going to be global, right? P different people from the continent, Africa, uh, different people from the Americas. Our, you know, in part because this is an empire. Right, you, AFRICOM, and before that, like, I think I mentioned Patrice Lumumba, Cabral. We can even talk about Che Guevara, right? I think it was 67 in Bolivia. I mean, we we don't, as civilians, we, we don't control the CIA, okay? That's like a major problem because the domestic policies here of repression are exported into international zones, right? It's global. We need to control our police forces on every level, right? The local cops, the National Guard, the FBI, the NSA, you know, um, CIA, I mean, there's more, DEA, there's just like tons of, this is such a mil militarized democracy. I mean, and it traffics in violence, that is both like, it's got a state register, but it's also private, like Eric Prince, right? It's Betsy DeVos's, oh, she's wrecking education, public education. You know, her brother, Navy SEAL, um, retired, is, you know, amassing a billion dollar industry of mercenaries. So if, if our state outsources the violence to like their buddies, Eric Prince, who were trained by the state, we will not have the reach that we need to quell or diminish the violence that is coming from the U.S. I mean, the, the U.S. is what makes us internationalists. Even if you didn't plan to be, there's no way to struggle internally inside the U.S. because the way in which it does its policies, both military and economic, it's transnational, it's global. And so AFRICOM keeps coming up and I think the Black Agenda Report is a good place for resources and Black Alliance for Peace, right? Um, they're well-informed and they're internationalists you know, themselves. So this is a great time to educate ourselves. And I've already told you about my deficiencies. So I need to work harder to learn more, right? And to participate more in Black internationalists or internationalist um, Pan-Africanist endeavors, including there's a global abolitionist network that's doing a lot of work in the Middle East. And so I was on a platform where I was learning from Kurdish women about how they maintain their own sovereignty and safety 
in relationship to self-defense. We're, um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> We're doing the catch up. The younger people are already there, at least in, in relationship to me, they're ahead, right? You know, because I've been focusing on other things and they were worthy endeavors like black feminism and other things like that. But now I'm moving, I'm not dropping those things, but I'm moving closer to where the most activists and the most um, thoughtful, I would say, of the young activists are, right? That they're organizing globally. They're looking at not just what Chris Smalls is doing in terms of organizing Amazon workers, right? Or in Staten Island or what organizing is happening in the state or within the United States. But again, they're seeing the impact, the repercussions or the connectors that are global. I was talking earlier about the connectors of our communities, right? Well, the state has its own connectors too. And I would say we need to cut or sever some of those connections. The connections to constant militarism, to NATO in the extent, like when I think of NATO, I think of Portugal being the first or one of the first European countries to get into African enslavement and torture. And one of the last to get out of the 1970s and NATO's backing Portugal when Cabral and other African freedom fighters are being assassinated. And like, how do you get Mobutu, you know, like running something, you know, as in the, another form of, of mass death, it's because the US is involved or NATO is involved. So we would have to rein in these militaristic and predatory formations that wanna reshape the world so that genocide is an ongoing phenomenon, right? And I think we can do it all. I don't even know how other than through connectors. Joyce McMillan is gonna focus on foster care, right? And like abolish foster care as we know it. Others are gonna say abolish AFRICOM. Others are gonna say what's going on in the Middle East or Latin America. Others will say, wait, uh, as I heard in the news like months ago, from 2015 to the current moment, there've been over a thousand environmentalists who've been murdered or assassinated and disproportionately they're indigenous, right? Or black. So our job, like our jobs are as parents with kids, our jobs with communities, and it doesn't matter your age, like Jonathan was 17, he was trying to save lives and he ended up losing his life in the process, meaning Jonathan Jackson. Our jobs are to build connectors that radiate out, almost like concentric circles like waves, right? And to back and protect each other so that when the intimidation comes, and it, it doesn't have to be the violence that makes the news, it can be like, we, we no longer want to employ you, right? Or we, we don't believe your kids should be in this school because they're always talking about anti-racism or LGBTQ rights, or they're making other students feel uncomfortable, et cetera, et cetera. Or what's going on now, like even white allies who are trying to teach a simple book, but like, let's just not be reactionary, or like, oh, you don't have a job anymore. So that, that for me is like, yeah, we're global, we're national, we're local. And if we stay connected, then we become more powerful. If we stay disconnected or become disconnected, then, you know, we're siloed and it's easier to dismantle us or co-opt us or ground us down into dust. The last thing I might add, right? When I was talking to the grad, you know, again, I'm learning from all these 20 year olds. So I'm old enough to be, eager to learn from them, right? I'm sure decades ago, I'd be like, please be quiet and listen to me. Now I'm like, okay, tell me more. So my, the 20 something year olds, like they tell me I missed a stage in the captive maternal. I missed the stage of betrayal. And I said this on a podcast with Rebecca Ann Wilcox. 
And I won't say which ones told me, but they were like, let's off the Captain Maternal. And then I was, yeah, my eyebrows went up too. And then I was like, wait, because I already told you, you know, what zone I operate in and it's not the militant freedom fighter zone. I'm just trying to be helpful. But I was like, okay, how can we allow those who are compromised and who seek to compromise us to stay in the zone, but hold them to accountability, right? And I think this is like, because you said you watched the accountability summit, right? And so that's what we were trying to do. I mean, other people could say we're trying to do something else, but I don't think anybody's disposable. But I do know that people will betray you. And then they will turn it around and make it like you betrayed me or something like that. No, you're the one who aired. I didn't do anything. You're the one who's off script. But I think if we can accommodate that, like built in, you know, like how insurance companies like have a built in loss metric here, like we're just going to lose 20 percent no matter what we do. Like, yeah, just build it in so that we don't have to like be distracted by it. Stuff always happens and it always goes south. But it doesn't do that 100% of the time. And so if we have firewalls, if we have security, if we have healing, disciplinary, like structures, not disciplinary to beat you down, but that we're disciplined. If we think globally, internationally, if we understand the we are an extension of the natural environment, you poison the water, you poison us. I mean, Freddie Gray, right? So is that chain, the lead paint? So like somebody says, stop. Some people neurologically, if you yell stop, they won't stop. They'll run. Doesn't mean they're a threat or that you should kill them by severing their spine, right? In a police wagon. And it's not enough, the payouts. The pay, I'm like, take the money, but just tell them, like money is not a resurrection of a beloved. So you killed somebody. So you need to like leave and then find another zone of employment. And that is not just for the individual, it's for the entire apparatus. Social workers need to find something else to do. They could be gardeners, they could like be pre-K, I don't know, whatever they wanna do. But the power that the police forces give them to remove children and destroy or break families, that power has to be severed. And so I'm back to the repeat. That has to be severed, not just within the nation or the state or the community, it has to be severed globally. And if you want a kinder verb, then just say disconnected. We need to disconnect the reach of that form of power and reconnect our capacity to radiate. And there will be a confrontation. And I don't think we should off anybody, actually, but we have the right to self-defense. And self-defense is not a form of violence. Thank you for saying that. And um, you've also discussed NATO, Emil, Emil Carr Cabral and NATO's expansionism. And I wanted to talk to you about um, the conflict in Ukraine. We are now two months into the, con well, depending on how you measure it, you can go back to 2014, you go back to the 1990s, you can go back to the 1940s. But looking at it, I guess I shouldn't even limit it. Um, but Considering the conflict in Ukraine now, um, and particularly from the statements and budgetary requests of Biden and his administration, the U.S. seems to me to be using Ukraine as um, a U.S. NATO-led proxy war against Russia. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on the topic. Yeah. So, you know, full disclosure, like I said, I'm not a, quote, specialist in international politics or whatever, but um, what I know of the U.S., it doesn't make an intervention unless it's going to be self aggrandizing right? Unless the U.S. can accumulate out of that. They don't, they don't just like, oh, we want to free the, I mean, they sold it. That was the propaganda, Radio Free Europe and all that stuff. We're just here to free you. Um, the U.S. doesn't do that. And Henry Kissinger and Brzezinski, you know, they wrote a paper back in the 1980s, Discriminate Deterrence, which I talked about in Resisting State Violence, which is you know, the first book I did, it was in 96, right? Is they're just really clear. Um, it, this is different because it's back in Europe, but they were, most of the wars are gonna be fought in the so-called third world. And that's where the losses are, but we're gonna make accumulations. And, and how many people die is 
not really an ethical issue for us. And so like my dad was in Nam. And so I, I understand 55,000 US personnel died, but two to three million Vietnamese, which is a genocide. So why now with Ukraine would the US change its whole modality and the way in which it operates? I mean, did it really send death squads into Nicaragua or El Salvador because they wanted democracy there? I mean, the U.S. doesn't do democracy. It does other things and then it, they stamp it with democracy, right? So my position, I follow a bit the War Resisters League and I know they're being criticized and people are told to rally and stand up. And so this is my version. People might think that I'm not standing but sitting. My approach would be um, demilitarize. I mean, Russia is not, I mean, Russia is what we know Russia to be. It is what Putin is, right? It's authoritarian, it's repressive. So I would say Russia needs to withdraw. The US needs to withdraw and NATO needs to withdraw. And it's, you know, it, I'm just rifting here because I'm not I'm not the international politics person, but you can't even trust the UN peacekeepers because they're not really autonomous. I mean, that whole narrative about why they weren't called in to go into Rwanda is because you know nobody wanted to pay for it. And so Susan Rice and Clinton and others agreed not to label it as a genocide and just allowed it to unfold. And so years later, you can still have these tribunals and somebody's going to be on trial or be put in prison. But that's like after the barn burned down, right? After the mass graves. So there's no, um, how do I say, there's no thoughtful anticipation on how to stop, stop wars. The U.S starts them. I mean, that was the whole Middle East. And I think Danny Haifong, is that how to pronounce his name? Like he had this really interesting article on intersectional imperialism when Madeleine Albright transitioned or died, right? He said, yeah, she's an intersectional feminist, but she's also an imperialist, right? An intersectional imperialist. And the intersectionality is so open-ended as a container, like everybody could claim it. So, so is the term democracy. It's really open-ended. People are defining it in self-serving ways. So yeah, you, the US is gonna get something out of it, which is why they put something into it, meaning militarism. Should Russia have invaded? You know, I, as much as I talk about military background, whatever, I actually support peace, so I don't think they should have, but I don't think NATO should have expanded either. So I think, based on what I know, that NATO is an artifact of continued accumulations. It's not necessarily a formation for protection. So if you look at what it does in Africa and other places, Historically, it has diminished equity, justice, human rights, civil rights. And when you write about the money, I mean, the kind of money that and the people matter. So I don't want to diminish that. A lot of people are dying right now, and that is a tragedy. But back to discriminant deterrence, I believe that was the title of Kissinger's paper with Brzezinski. It's, it, it, the, the human cost of life doesn't mean anything to an empire. I mean, that's, again, that's why you can have Kissinger do like carpet bombing in Vietnam. I mean, they don't care how many people die. It's getting a little weird now because it's, you know, they appear white and everything. And it's kind of like, oh, I, you look like my relative or something like that. But when they were black or Asian, African, Asian, Latin American stuff, it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal on a U.S. conscience, except for the activists. So back to the War Resisters League, I mean, people are going to die there unless they agree to demilitarize all the parties. And I don't have the skill set to say how you would get to that point. People are going to die here in the U.S. because of funds that would be needed for health care, 
and other vital issues, you know, housing. I was reading the New York Times, like the people dying the subways who are getting hit by subways are probably unhealthed people who are living underground and in cabins. So there's like a sci-fi thing going on, right? A futuristic, you know, dystopian, you know, horror show. But there's not going to be um, there's not going to be the funds. They're, they're not going to put the funds into what we need to stay stable, stable and healthy. They're going to always put the funds into war. And I think the the biggest problem we have, like given how the reactionaries and proto fascists, you know, it's, you can't just call them Marjorie or whoever, but you know the whole. Um, mindset is, is is in congress right much more so than before i would i would wager much more so than before the trump presidency the, our biggest problem one of the biggest problem is going to be the continuation of wars like this and the fact that the right wing underground the proto-fascist underground is above ground in the US. And so there's a compatibility with this violence that's radiating. Like however people are saying, we've got this, we can contain this. We know like we can beat them kind of thing. There's nobody gonna win out of this conflict, right? But there's some people who are gonna get training. And those are gonna be the proto-fascists. You know, like we, <laughs> They're like, we needed a training ground. We read, read all the manuals, you know, we, you know, we, where are we going to go? What, what war can we go to, to train in? And obviously they could like work for Eric Prince or, you know, they can do something else. We have as tragic as what's going on is happening in Ukraine. And that's not the only war, right? It's just the one that the media wants to focus on because it's European wise, right? We have a problem with war writ large. And that means we would have to have a strategy. So I am really interested in how the peace movement, as we've known it in the past, expands and reinvents itself for the 21st century, where the killing now is not just going to be in this quote, so-called third world, those are air quotes, but it's back in Europe. And I think people are horrified because it's back in Europe, not because there's killing. There's been killing nonstop. Well, thank you for, for your analysis on Ukraine. Um, those are all the questions I have for you today. Is there anything you, else you wanted to add or mention before we end? No, I mean, I appreciate speaking with you, Ryan. I mean, it's, I really, I mean, I'm, I'm going to stop doing these things, right? Because, you know, there are other things that I have to do, but, you know, there's family and, and other stuff that you have to tend to. Mm -hmm. But this is community. And in the, especially with COVID, especially if you're like busy as an academic and most of the people you roll with, you know, your day job, you're within this, you know, bureaucracy. So you forget, I mean, you look out the window, but you really forget what natural communal environments look like, sound like, feel like. I appreciate that you're gardening. I mean, the, the youth laugh at me. they like, every time you talk, you have a different job. And this one, you're a librarian. The other one, you're like, you know, you're a gardener. <laughs> what are you? But what I can say is I'm committed to learning more and sharing with community. And I always say, I don't get it all right. Often it's flawed, but the political will and the heart to be in conversation is the first step towards a serious community to deal with the material conditions that will improve our lives and the lives of our children and elders. And obviously not just in the States, but across the globe. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I know I've taken up over an hour and a half of your day. Um, but it's been a true honor to learn from you and, and be in conversation with you. So thank you so much. Okay, stay well, Ryan.